in the second paragraph on page 67, it says, referring to our list again. See, you've got to have a written inventory. This is the second time we've had to go back to it now. Referring to our list again. Putting out of our minds the wrongs others had done. We resolutely looked for our own mistakes. Uh-oh. We've never done this, have we? We've always looked to see what they did. We've never looked to see what we did. Where had we been selfish, dishonest, self-seeking, and frightened? Though a situation not been entirely our fault, we tried to disregard the other person involved entirely. Where were we to blame? The inventory was ours, not the other man's. When we saw our faults, we listed them, we placed them before us in black and white. We admitted our wrongs honestly and were willing to set these matters straight. So we go to the fourth column. And if you'll notice the heading on the fourth column said, What did I do? Putting out of mind the wrongs others have done, I resolutely look for my own mistakes. What did I do, if anything, to set in motion trains of circumstances which in turn caused people or institutions to hurt me and eventually led to my resentment of them for doing so? So I went to column four. And I looked at this uh, lady named Barbara. And I said, now Charlie, you forget what she did. You forget her filing for three divorces. What did you do, if anything, to set that in motion? And it took me just about five seconds to realize that if I hadn't been out there screwing around, she probably wouldn't have caught me. And she probably wouldn't have filed for divorce in the first place. Took me another two or three seconds to say to myself, well, if I hadn't been sneaking around behind her back lying to her all the time, completely dishonest with her, she probably wouldn't have filed for divorce in the first place. Another three or four seconds and I was able to say to myself, well, if I hadn't been blowing all of her money on booze and what I think was important, she probably wouldn't have filed for divorce in the first place. And I began to realize why I loved that resentment. Because you see, when I could concentrate on her filing for divorce and play that over and over and over and over in my head, gradually distorting the picture every time I played it over, making what she did a little bit worse and what I did a little bit less and let me play it long enough I could gradually transfer all blame to her and make myself as pure as the driven snow and it was all her damn fault in the first place I thought my God Charlie have you done that with any other resentments here? I looked at the Internal Revenue Service. I said, now forget what they're doing to you trying to put you in jail. What did you do, if anything, to set in motion the fact they're trying to put you in jail? Well, I didn't take two seconds to be able to say if I hadn't been cheating on my income tax, they wouldn't have been trying to put me in jail anyhow. And rather than look at what I had done to them, I had played it over and over and over and over, distorted the picture, transferred all blame to them, made myself as pure as the driven snow. That way I could continue through life doing what I wanted to do and never have to look at me because after all, it's all their fault in the first place. Showing this resentment against Rose, what did you do, if anything, to set that in motion? Charlie was out there screwing around, but I was committing adultery. Okay. <laughs> Sneaking around behind her back and lying to her all the time. And Rose finally got enough of it. She said, I'll show him. And she went out and had her own affair. And Joe had, over a period of time, 
played that resentment over and over, gradually transferred all blame to him or to her, made himself as pure as the driven snow. I went down through my list of resentments. I never found a name on there that I hadn't done something to them to set this thing in motion. And I had resented it and played it over and over and distorted the picture, transferred all blame to them, made myself as pure as the driven snow. If you're a practicing alcoholic, you've got to develop these kind of skills. You know, we have a conscience. We're not drunken bones. We know the difference between right and wrong. And I don't think we could live with ourselves if we had to honestly see what was going on whenever we're out there doing our thing. But you see, we never have to see it because we've got this convenient thing called resentments that we play them over and over, distort the picture, and transfer all blame to others. And we men go from woman to woman to woman, and you ladies go from man to man to man. And we go from job to job to job. And we go from city to city to city. And we go from country to country to country. And it's always their damn fault. That's the only way we could live the kind of life we were living. By being able to transfer blame to others. And none of us realize how much we've been doing that until we take an honest look at these resentments and see the part that we played. Now in the fifth column you see the major character defects talked about in the big book. Where had I been selfish, dishonest, self-seeking, frightened, or inconsiderate? All other character defects stem from these. In the fifth column I asked myself this question. Which of the above character defects caused me to do what I did? Or caused me to want to hold on to the old resentment even though I may have done nothing to cause it? Now going back to Barbara again. If I hadn't have been so selfish, I wouldn't have been out there doing those things that hurt my wife and children. If I hadn't have been so dishonest, I, I wouldn't have been sneaking around behind her back lying to her all the time. If I hadn't been so self-seeking and frightened, saying to myself, Man, you're getting close to 40 years old. If you're ever going to do some of that, you better go do it before it's too late. Fear drives us to do things like that. If I hadn't been so inconsiderate of my wife and children, I wouldn't have been taking the chance of hurting them in the first place. I begin to see in the fifth column the type of character I had become through my years of living a life run on self-will. And when I saw it, I didn't like it. It made me sick. You see, I always fancied myself as a reasonably good person until I saw how I'd become so selfish and so dishonest and so inconsiderate of other people that I was continually doing things that hurt others. And they retaliated and I resented for it. I begin to see that if I don't change those things in the fifth column, if I stay selfish, dishonest, self-seeking, frightened, and inconsiderate, that I'm going to keep right on doing the same old things I've always done, drunk or sober. I'm going to keep right on hurting people. And they're going to retaliate. And I'm going to resent. And eventually it's going to block me off from God and I'm going to get drunk over it. But just think, if I could become a little less selfish, oh, I don't have to get perfect, I never will. But if I could become a little less selfish, if I could become a little less dishonest, if I could become less frightened and self-seeking, if I could become a little more considerate of other people and their needs and their wants, maybe I wouldn't have to do some of that kind of stuff. Maybe I wouldn't hurt people, and maybe they wouldn't retaliate, and I wouldn't have to resent. And just maybe I wouldn't have to get drunk over it. 
You see, what we're really doing here is step four. This is the resentment part of it. But out in the fifth column, I now see the exact nature of the wrongs that I'm going to talk to another human being about when I take step five. The resentment is the wrong. That's what blocks me off from God. But what's the exact nature of it? That means what's the truth of it? What's at the core of it? What's the inherent characteristic of it? That's what we'll talk about in step five. You know, when a guy comes to me and he's committed adultery 44 times, I don't care about that. All I want to know is what is within him that caused him to do it in the first place. If he's stolen 364 times, I don't care about that. What I want to know is what's within him that caused him to do that. That's what we'll talk about in step five. In that fifth column, I now see the character defects, and I'm going to become willing to turn loose of in step six. Out there in that fifth column, I see the shortcomings now I'm going to ask God to take away in step seven. And in my case, all the names from column one came off of this sheet to be added to the sheet later to be used for steps eight and nine. Because you see, when I get to step eight, it says I've got the list. I made it when I took step four. In my case, every one of those. In your case, probably some of them. In my case, all of them. Now what I've really done, if I have done this the way the big book says, is I have prepared myself with all the information I need for steps four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine, resentment-wise. Not only have I gathered all the information I need for 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9. Well, I've had a positive result here. Resentments have disappeared. And they've been replaced with love, patience, tolerance, compassion, and goodwill. Did we do anything to be afraid of? Did we make a list of dirty, filthy, nasty items? No. Did we do anything that was too complicated? No. I've never seen anything like this inventory, according to the big book. Now, I hear some of you saying, and and I hear awful good. I've got good hearing. Charlie hears good. I hear some of you saying, well, well, Charlie, that's probably right on those that we did something to them. But how about those that did it to us? And we didn't have anything to do with that. How about those that hurt us as kids growing up? How about those that hurt us in our marriages that we didn't do anything to cause it? Aren't we justified in having that kind of resentment? Well, I guess we are if we want to get drunk over it. But you see, a justified resentment blocks you off from God just like an unjustified resentment does. When you got a justified resentment churning around in your head, then whoever or whatever you're resenting is controlling your thinking. If they're controlling your thinking, they're controlling your decisions. They're controlling your life for you. And you have given them power to actually kill you. Because you've given them power to cause you to get drunk again. Now if you've got one of those resentments... And I don't care what it is. I don't care whether it's physical abuse, mental abuse, sexual abuse, or whatever. I keep hearing in AA all the time this sexual abuse thing. It usually centers on young women. But let me tell you something. Men know about that too. I don't know how many fifth steps I've taken with men, and nearly every one of us, somewhere in the background, we've had that kind of stuff too. It's not just women, it's men. If you've got one of those kind of resentments, and you don't want to get rid of it, knowing full well it might get you drunk, then we better get it on this sheet of paper and take a look at it, and see what we're doing with it. We're probably using it for rationalization and justification. To rationalize not doing things we ought to go do 
or just as importantly to rationalize and justify doing things that we shouldn't be doing in the first place. Oh, the greatest excuse in the world is if they hadn't have done that to me, then I wouldn't have to be the way I am today. They call that victimization. Now, I don't really think we got any place for that in AA. We're all adults. It's time for us to realize that whatever's happened to in us in the past does not have to control what we do today. Now, the only reason for that is to justify, rationalize, and etc. The woman in the book, she used her resentment against her mother to justify her lack of education. Bull. She could have gotten an education if she wanted to bad enough. She used it to justify her marital failure. Bull. Mama didn't have anything to do with her marital failure. She even used it to justify her alcoholism. Mama had nothing to do with her alcoholism. She became alcoholic because she drank whiskey. And she drank enough of it, she became alcoholic. And I think it's time for us to realize we are responsible for what we think and how we feel. We are responsible for what we do today. Mother and daddy and other people are no longer responsible for that. Maybe they were when we were little kids, but we're not little kids any longer. It really doesn't make any sense to let somebody hurt me 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago and then let them hurt me every day for the rest of my life. If I'm resenting them, they've got me and they're going to kill me. I need to put them on this sheet. Put down their name. What did they do to me? What part of self is affected? What did I do, if anything, to set it in motion? In this case, nothing. But then let's look in the fourth column. Are we so dishonest with ourselves we refuse to see the truth? If you've got a resentment in your head today, it's not true. I'm going to say that again. If you've got a resentment in your head today, it's not true. Oh, it was based on truth, and it's partially true. But if you've played it over and over and over, you've distorted it, and it's no longer true. Can we honestly look at it and see the truth behind it? Let's look in the fifth column and see if maybe we are so frightened of facing life without it. We refuse to turn it loose. Because you know, after all, if we turn it loose, then we've got to take responsibility for our own behavior. It's a hell of a lot easier to blame it on others. Are we so afraid of facing life without it? We won't turn it loose. Are we so inconsiderate of another human being that we fail to recognize that people that do those things to us, they're not necessarily bad people. They're sick people. If they didn't necessarily do it to us, they would have done it to anybody in that position. If we could even begin to consider that, maybe we can start a forgiving process. Maybe we could straighten up a relationship with another human being before it's too late. After they're dead, it's too late. I'll guarantee you it is. Maybe we can do it while we're all still alive. If we will do those things, I think we can get rid of that resentment too when we really see the truth behind it and what we're doing with it. If we can't get rid of it that way, then we can use the ultimate tool. By golly, we can pray for them. And if we pray for one of those people to resent, that doesn't mean that we approve of what they did. That doesn't mean we're going to take them by the hand and walk hand in hand with them for the rest of our life. What it means is we're tired of letting them control us, dominate us, and rule us every day for the rest of our life. We can get rid of those kind of resentments too. And if we don't want to do that, then chances are we're using it for some reason. And we need to look at it very, very carefully, Joe. It takes two people to make a prison, the prisoner and the jailer. You have to turn them loose and let them out and turn them loose. All those people that I hated had to turn them loose. Charlie said, I don't want to be a victim in, anymore. And I don't think Alcoholics Anonymous may be the only association left on the face of the earth that won't allow us to be victims. There's victims going on all out there. Everybody wants to be a victim of something. You know, but we in AA won't let each other do that because we have a way out. 
when everything else fails, we can pray for them. They need the prayers and we need to practice. You know, I see in many AA meetings where we've gone into this group therapy stuff and we sit around the table and we discuss what those people did to us and we try to figure out why they did it. We'll never understand why they did it. The thing is, they did it. Then we start trying to discuss and figure out why it made us the way we are. We'll never understand that. The fact is, that's the way we are. The real question is, what are we going to do about it? Are we going to continue to let them kill us? Or are we going to get rid of that jazz? That's what AA is about. It's not to sit around and talk about problems. It's to sit around and talk about how do you solve the problems. And resentment is the number one problem for every alcoholic. And if we can get rid of them, then we're peaceful, happy, and free. Until we do, we'll never be free of it. We went through a process yesterday afternoon, the first part of the inventory process. There we learned how to look at our resentments, to take an honest, truthful, moral inventory. And as we listed those resentments, we began to see the truth about them, really. Now, the first thing we saw in column one is how many resentments we really did have, how much that blocked us off from the sunlight of the Spirit. The second thing we saw in column two, it's not those people or institutions we resent, it's what they've done to us that we actually resent. The third thing we found out in column three, it's really not even what they've done to us, it's how we choose to react to a threat to one of our basic instincts of life which is going to determine whether we're resentful or not. So just in filling out those three columns we learned some very valuable information. We also were able to see in the big book that resentments was an absolute waste of time. Whenever they're churning around in our heads we're pretty well paralyzed from doing anything worthwhile. And we find that if we honestly look at them, most of us have spent literally thousands and thousands of hours in resentments. And as we look back at that time in our lives, we can see where they really never did do us any good. They never really straightened up a relationship with another human being. Never made us feel better. Only made us feel worse. Never made us any money for sure. And as far as we can tell, it's absolute wasted time. But we also said that's not the worst thing about a resentment. The worst thing is it very effectively blocks us off from God. Blocked off from God, we don't feel good. We begin to become insane. We begin to think about taking a drink. Next thing you know, we end up drunk all over again. And when we truthfully and honestly looked at those resentments, we could really begin to see how other people have controlled and dominated us throughout our entire lifetime through those resentments. Now, we always thought that we had it under control, that we determined what we said and what we did, but we suddenly realized that we really have done nothing but react to others through our resentment toward them. That looks so stupid to us that about 95% of those resentments automatically disappear. The other 5% that was so deeply embedded we found through prayer that we could remove them also so we could be resentment free if we follow the, the uh, procedures outlined in the big book. The real revealing thing is though, the amazing thing is that after we became resentment free, God wouldn't allow another hole in our head, it had to be replaced with something else. The only thing that could replace it was the opposite of the resentment. And where we used to feel resentment, we now feel serenity, a little peace of mind, a little happiness, compassion, goodwill, love. Those are all God's thinking rather than our individual thinking. And we found that that came to us automatically. Those things had always been a part of us. We just never could use them before. Now that resentments are gone, then God's thinking automatically begins to replace the resentment, and we're much less chance of getting drunk now than we were when we started the process. We went back to the resentment sheet, and we looked at it from an entirely different angle now. We began to look at it to see what had we done to set that thing in motion, or what did we do? We had never looked at before. And in our fourth column, we found that in almost all cases, Whatever the resentment was, we ourselves did something to set it in motion. And we hurt other people, 
They retaliated. We resented. We played the resentment over and over and over, distorted the picture, finally transferred all blame to other people. A good practicing alcoholic has to be able to do that. We just couldn't live if we didn't have that ability. So we really, in the fourth column, really did begin to look at the truth of the resentment to see the part that we had played. And in most cases, we ourselves set the ball rolling. We looked in the fifth column to see the exact nature of that resentment. The resentment was the wrong, but what was at the actual core of it or at the center of it? And in the fifth column, we found the type personality that we had developed through our years of living on self-will and living as a practicing alcoholic. And we found just about every time we had hurt anybody in the past, it was either through selfishness or through dishonesty or because we were self-seeking frightened or through inconsideration of other people. And we begin to see in the fifth column that if we don't change those things, we're going to keep right on doing the same things in sobriety that we used to do when drinking. We're going to continue to hurt people. They're going to retaliate. We'll resent and eventually get drunk over it. And we begin to see in the fifth column the things that we will need to change in our personality if we want to live with peace of mind, serenity, and happiness in the future. We summed it up by saying we were in the process of doing the resentment part of step four. In the fifth column, we now had all the information we needed for steps five, six, and seven. And in the names in the first column, those that we had harmed, they come off of there to be added to the list to be used for eight and nine at a later date. So we really ended up in this simple little inventory with all the information we needed for four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine resentment-wise. Very positive thing took place, resentments disappeared, and they were replaced with love, patience, tolerance, compassion, and goodwill. So there was nothing to be afraid of. There was nothing too complicated. There was not a list of dirty, filthy, nasty items, just a simple inventory. Now, we don't want to give you the impression <clears throat> that you can always be 100% free of resentments. You know, God never gave us anything bad. It depends on what we do with things as to whether they become bad or not. The resentment used right can be used for a worthwhile purpose. If somebody does something to me that threatens my self-esteem, if it would cause me to look at me and see some things that I need to change, and I go ahead and make those changes, then that resentment can be used for a worthwhile purpose. For instance, if we're living in the neighborhood, all the old houses are run down. Mine's no worse than anybody else's. They all need painting. They got broken window screens and panes. And I sit on my front porch each evening after work, and I rock and I rock, and I'm very complacent about that situation. One day I look up, though, and some idiot has moved in across the street. He's out there painting his house fixing his window screens and window panes makes my house look bad. I resent the hell out of him for doing that. I say, who in the hell is he moving here and in here and screwing up this whole neighborhood? Now, if I use that resentment right, it'll cause me to look at my house and become a little bit ashamed of it. Next thing you know, I paint my house, fix my window screens and window panes. My next door neighbor resents me for doing so. Next thing you know, he fixes his house up and his neighbor resents him. And after a while, God's got the whole neighborhood cleaned up like it should have been in the first place. That's the proper use of a resentment. But we alcoholics won't use it that way. We'll sit on the front porch and we'll rock and we'll rock and we'll resent and we'll resent. Thirty days later, we'll go over at midnight and burn his damn house down. We'll show him. <coughs> so it really depends on what we do with resentments that determines whether they're going to be for bad or good. And if we use one rightly, it's going to disappear anyhow. The ones that kill us are those that we just leave in our head and it is fester and fester and fester and we get sicker and sicker until eventually it creates a real problem for us. Joe? This morning we're going to talk about fears a bit. And uh, we're, going to, no, we're not going to psychoanalyze ourselves in any manner. We're simply going to do like the book suggested yesterday. We're going to find the facts and we're going to face the facts and eventually through this process we're going to accept the facts as they really are truthfully 
And it says also that when the spiritual malady is overcome, we straighten out mentally and physically. The spiritual malady not only is my relationship with God, but my relationship with me, my mental attitudes, and my relationship with other people. <clears throat> so that's just another form of spiritual malady that I had. And Dr. Jung said we're going to that we're going to have a look at our ideas, emotions, and attitudes. And that's what we're doing through this inventory process. We're looking at ideas, emotions, and attitudes and see where they came from. And if we will, we'll go back now from page 18. And I'm going to read this little paragraph. It tells my whole story in one little paragraph. It says, An illness of this sort, and we've come to believe it an illness, involves those about us in a way no other human sickness can. If a person has cancer, all are sorry for him, no one is angry or hurt. But not so with the alcoholic illness. For with it goes annihilation of all things worthwhile in life, and engulfs all whose life touches the sufferers. It brings misunderstanding, fierce resentment, financial insecurity, disgusted friends and employers, warped lives of blameless children, sad wives and parents, and anyone can increase the list. In other words, it's a family illness. It affects everybody in the family to some extent. And if you live with one of us very long, you'll be affected by it in some manner, for sure. And as I look back in my life to see where these ideas, emotions, and attitudes that were, that, that were to become the guiding force of my life started way, way back. Then a man rode into town, somebody was the law. A village was waiting when he came. He told me he would take her if I didn't use my gun. But myself to blame I went down to the dusty streets What was on my mind I guess that stranger had to turn the in Cause I shot first and killed him Although they didn't even draw And now I spent my lifetime running With the Mexican women Yeah Is there anything a man gonna stand to lose When he lets a woman hold him in her hand he Just might find himself out there on horseback just riding and running across the